in your body that um, you think might be harming your body. Um, you know, like you, if I continue to do this, I'm really going to have back trouble or muscle trouble or whatever it might be. Then, um, first of all, when the pain comes on, of course, quietly adjust, perhaps move to a chair. Um, and also, if that is happening, I would suggest um, experimenting with different ways of sitting. One of the disadvantages of these, you know, wonderful opportune online retreats um, for, for an intro retreat, we can't really go around and help people uh, with posture. And um, so a, a few pointers would be uh, sitting toward the forward edge of the cushion if you're on a cushion, uh, making sure that that tripod effect, uh, that your knees are all the way down. So um, if your knees aren't, I mean, of course, if you're in a chair, your feet are flat on the floor, but if your knees aren't all the way down, something about uh, what you're sitting on isn't a good fit for you and for your level of flexibility. Um, so that, you know, that is tremendously helpful to get that stability and to be sitting forward. And then to have that, you know, sort of at the flexibility at the hips where you can have that little, um, natural, some people, it's different for everybody, but there's usually a little curve in the back. So the belly actually falls forward a little. And um, if you're not finding comfort on a cushion, whether it's kneeling on the cushion or cross-legged, uh, Burmese, half lotus, um, but knees down, try a bench. Um, try a, a low, I noticed Susan has a really nice flat, low, um, backless chair that would be very uh, stable. Um, if the pain is of the sort that, um, you know, once you get up and move around, it will stop, um, then breathe into it. It can actually be helpful. Um, if, if you let yourself just breathe into the pain, even let there be nothing but that pain, nothing outside it, you might be surprised how it goes away. Um, when I was starting out, um, I'm, I'm not by nature flexible, still not, but um, I found that um, kneeling on a, on a cushion on a Zafu worked for me. I could really do that. And of course I still had, I had pain from tension that was completely unnecessary. <laughs> it took some years to realize that I could just find the balance in sitting and release that. And, and then, you know, sit all day without neck pain or back pain uh, because I'm not holding something uh, against myself. I'm just letting the body sit. Um, but when I started to work on sitting cross-legged on the floor on a cushion, I would alternate um, in, in a retreat, in a session setting. So this long sitting, that can be a nice strategy. Uh, if you have two ways that are really balanced, then you can um, change it up. Um, yeah. I mean, this is such a, a common question and this practice is not meant to be, um, to be harmful in any way. And it can really, we can learn to do it uh, with a kind of ease. But these strategies of having different modes of sitting, um, really checking, working with your posture. Again, I said yesterday when asked by this student, Rion Roshi, 
uh, which is most important, posture, breathing, or stilling the mind, he said posture right away. Um, yeah, I. So so check it out. You know, if if you sit all day, or even if if in sitting, um, and we get up for walking, and whatever is hurting doesn't release. Uh, I would most definitely find, you know, an alternative. Um, of course, also, here we are in Zoom, you're each in your own space. It's not going to disturb anyone to make little adjustments while sitting. So 15 minutes into the sit, foot's falling asleep or the posture is painful. It's, it's possible to adjust without um, distracting anyone, but it would distract you. <laughs> so it's quite helpful to find a posture that you can, you can maintain in some poise for 25 minutes. Uh, just something to work with. Over time, um, this this, I'm amazed at how this improves. There was another question we'll get to about um, some exercises that can help it too. But um, yeah, I would never ever let pain keep me from sitting. Um, you know, I would, I would, I will move to a chair when that day comes. And that's got its own challenges. But, uh, you know, it, it takes out of the equation the sort of flexibility that's required in the lower body. So, I, I mean, I hope that's, those are a few strategies at least. A uh, questioner asks, do you have any tips for focusing on the breath while still allowing lots of thoughts to go on in the background? Is that the right way to think about it? That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, again, this instruction from Dogen um, and that he's picking up from Master Yaksan, think not thinking. How, how do you do that? What is that? Non-thinking. Um, that is thought happening, but not in the least sticking to it. So, and it, I don't, it's, it's very different from monkey mind. It's not a kind of incessant thinking, but um, yeah, I mean, generally to this question, I would say, yes, uh, that is the experience of getting more and more quiet where you can really stay with the breath and, you know, thoughts and sensations come and go. Of course they do. Um, and it's, I know one thing, it is not helpful to, try to avoid, uh, you know, to, I, I said that yesterday that um, Rio Roshi had said, you know, don't, don't try to um, do battle with your thoughts. It's like shadow boxing. But he said, because there's nothing there. There's just no substance. So let them rise up and pass away. Um, there is another, uh, line in this really lovely essay by Dogen that I mentioned, the universal instructions or universal recommendations on Zazen, various translations, Fukan Zazenji. Uh, it's quite accessible, very rich, dense. But if you, if you haven't read Dogen and you'd like to read something, that would be one thing um, to take up. Um, and uh, it's easily available on the internet for free in different translations. Um, but the line that came to mind with this question was, he says, take the backward step and shine the light inward. So there's this turn. Some translators say, learn the backward step and shine the light inward. I've heard that um, described as, you know, being with, really 
watching the breath from something of a distance, likened to uh, coming upon a clearing in the woods and you know there's a wild animal sleeping in the clearing and just standing there and watching it breathe. Um, I, I found that, um, you know, I, I had never quite thought of it that way and experimenting with that opened up some space. Um, and, you know, just the, the care and attention and wonder at this breathing that's going on, it's going on. And um, I felt more absorbed uh, by, you know, in, in that experience of that backward step, that, that sense of space, of a little bit of distance. You know, one of the beautiful aspects of this, you know, take the backward step and shine the light inward. It's, that's, that's a description of this practice. But what comes out of it is this sense of inside and outside just starts to melt away. That space opens up. Um, and the more of that spaciousness and the more absorption, um, less distraction. Oh. Also, you know, obviously the practices like counting um, would be one. Mooing, if somebody's working with moo, would be another. Yeah. Uh, questioner asks, in your talk yesterday morning, what were the words the Zen master told the community why he was sitting in silence to relieve the drought? Yeah, that was Master Mumon, um, who compiled the Gateless Gate. Um, and when asked, you know, why aren't you performing rituals? This, this priest who was called on to um, end the drought went to the province, went into the temple, and just sat. And, you know, the, somebody from the province comes, one of the elders, and says, yeah, what are you doing? And Mumon says, silently not influencing anything. It, um, I think that so resounds with what we're doing in sitting. Um, and this sense of no one doing anything. Uh, there's another question that relates to this, but um, I, I uh, have a friend that I often connect with in the Boundless Way tradition. He's a teacher, which is a sort of cousin to Sambo Zen. And they had an online session not too long ago. And sort of the theme of this four or five days was um, to be a person with nothing to do. So while sitting, while standing, while walking, going off, they, they had Samu, you know, go then the evening in your own home, a person with nothing to do. Um, I remember a session with Joan Reek years ago, and in a talk, she told a story about um, a man who had been at a, a seven day retreat. You know, it's a kind of standard length for a full retreat. Um, and he had had a good session, you know, steady, deep sitting. Um, but no, you know, he'd, he'd long been sitting with Moo. There was, he hadn't had an opening. And you still, the, 
the deepening and the equanimity and the clarity and the compassion, you know, all those, this, this boundless first fruit of Zen. So he, you know, the session ended, he went home and the next day he got up and he went to work. And at the end of the day, he sent Joan an email saying, all these things are happening, but no one's doing anything. And to us listening, she said, that's Kensho. That, you know, remarkable freedom of um, just sitting, just standing, just typing, just making a phone call. There's a, um, a name for this one level of it when you hear a lot of talk in Zen, you know, just eating, just walking, just, 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 you know, which is simply a kind of mindfulness practice, right? Where you, um, you just give yourself to the one thing that you're doing. But in that, as, as helpful and rich and, uh, as that can be, it can really be a good, strong practice um, that can also lead to deepening. But there's still someone doing it, you know. I'm just concentrating on this one thing and nothing else. I'm mindfully eating. I'm mindfully typing. I'm mindfully talking. Um, there is a radical shift that can happen where that I just falls off. And then this no one doing anything, this functioning, the whole world is just, everything's functioning. Where, you know, I, I ran across this quote uh, from David Steindl Rast recently, um, when I, some, this is a paraphrase, but you know, the greatest marvel is that there's anything at all. I mean, here's somebody who's really tasted this nothing at all world. There's, not, there's just nothing of substance, nothing fixed. There's this great dynamism. But every, it's empty of substance. And so how is it that we're here? What is this? Uh, that's, that's sort of speaking to two questions, but when I heard for the first time this comment of Mumon silently not influencing anything. I, I was really touched. And it, I think it's because it, it's this great freedom where, you know, and, and the other thing is the, the power of Zazen. Uh, it's a, uh, this unifying, sometimes it feels like photosynthesis, you know, like, or like you are the liver and kidneys of the whole world. It's so connected, interconnected. You're embodying that interconnectedness. Um, and so I don't think it's magic at all that the story goes and I've probably true. Uh, there's a lot of history written then. I don't know. Anyway, it goes that, you know, he went to the temple, he sat Sazen in total freedom. And, you know, a couple days later, the drought ended. <laughs> well, I've heard Rian Roshi also say, you know, he's a very busy Japanese CEO, an Asian, you know, major company, international company. His he sleeps about four hours a night. I don't uh, prescribe that in any way for a person, but you know that's his way. And he sits and has for years two sits every morning, 
and one sit every night. He says the two sits in the morning are always at the same time, and the one sit at night, you know, just varies on the day. But he said, on a day when there's a particularly challenging meeting, I'll sit a third sit in the morning. And somehow things just take care of themselves. There's a backward step in that, isn't there? And a relinquishing uh, that I am here doing this. Um, yeah, that, that's really the great freedom and depths of this practice. In, you know, like Mumon said in his talk on Mu after his experience, the samadhi of innocent play. You know, that's this whole world. It's, of course, it's sitting also. But it's this microphone, this cushion, this computer, your faces. What we're doing here. We're not doing anything. <laughs> well. Okay, we have uh, two more questions from yesterday. Person asks, you say that it's not a good idea to take on a koan without a teacher. I'm very interested in working with koans. And I've been sitting with some, but this talk here is the most instruction that I've had in koans. Would you recommend that I pause my work with koans for the time being? Mm. Yeah, it's not totally clear how, what the work is with a koan. Uh, the the tradition is that a koan is given to a student by a teacher and that you then um, check in around your practice with that teacher. Um, I would have said before, um, it, this is really depends on a person's situation. Some people live so far from a sangha or a teacher, they just, they don't have that opportunity, but, you know, now we're also connected. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't give a, a totally definitive answer, depending, I, I have known people who have really had a resonance with the koans, and so reading in them uh, has been a kind of rich um, context for practice and a sort of an inspiration and you just get a sense of this world and a sense of the masters. Um, the, the danger, I think, I, I mean, maybe the dangers, well, it, it can become a conceptual way of engaging with koans. Um, and that, you know, that's only a danger in that it, it may make it more difficult you know, to unwind those entangling vines <laughs> when you have a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with someone. Um, I, I don't recommend bouncing around from koan to koan. Um, but again, if it's just sort of finding nourishment, uh, I have read some books on koans that just um, ha somehow convey, you know, something about this world that we're all exploring and discovering. And um, it, I wasn't actually, you know, one week this koan, one week that koan, sort of trying to really sit with it and see through it. But somehow, the, you know, taking it in, I found a kind of nourishment, a richness. Um, generally, I would till the soil of your practice uh, with just sitting or counting. And if, if you really feel like, you know, drawn to koan study, um, just 
uh, check in with uh, a teacher and see if, um, you know, where to begin. Uh, it, it might really be, uh, I mean, I would trust that in other words. Uh, so this is sort of speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but um, I, I think for some people, koan practice is just incredibly enlivening. And for others, it can just kind of stimulate the discursive mind and not, not really be so helpful. So uh, being drawn to them is an indication that it might really be for you, a really, really fruitful path. And again, then the tradition says, find a teacher. Okay, next question. Questioner asks, did we do, we did some movement and thank you, Susan, for that. Are there any exercises that you'd like or would recommend to gain strength and comfort during sits? Yes, I, I, uh, I saw that question and then Susan just took us through those, that last series of movement um, on the floor, uh, which exactly is like, this is the answer <laughs> to this question. Um, you know, the, those simple, slow, rather gentle stretching exercises for the legs, um, especially in the back, the way we were, you know, if you're uh, my body type, I can sit on the floor with my legs apart and flex my feet. And that feels like a really helpful stretch. And I can lean forward a few inches. Um, and if I do that every day, it's even though I can't, you know, go to the floor, I can tell that it's helpful. Um, over time, uh, even for a non-flexible person, those kinds of simple stretches and the act of sitting itself has been so helpful. One thing that um, a Japanese teacher once told me or it was, a, it was an Asian man who'd spent a long time in Japan. And so there, there they have these wonderful hot baths, you know, these deep tub soaking, and they like it really hot. Um, if you enjoy a hot bath, you know, American style tub, um, don't miss the opportunity if you can carve out five minutes after that, after you've soaked in a hot bath to do some stretching then. Uh, that is, you know, for us ordinary mortals, <laughs> it's really, really helpful. Um, there's no question that, that yoga helps people. Um, and there are different kinds. I, I think what Susan has been showing us is, you know, so helpfully basic and, um, as I, as I would say, especially this last series on the floor, uh, all the different simple positions with the legs, um, opening up, you know, just getting more flexible in the, the legs and lower back. I really appreciated that. Questioner asks, you spoke of letting sitting sit could you please say something about letting doing do? Yeah, that was the question that, um, you know, came to mind. I, I sort of felt it, um, you know, sort of echo or resound off of Mumon's statement, uh, silently not influencing anything. Um, and so this, you know, no one doing anything is, you know, it's just sitting is sitting. And this practice is so available to us all the time. I mean, um, driving, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know if I would start there because maybe it would be actually distracting uh, if you're not used to it, but, um, 
cooking, chopping vegetables, cleaning. I think that's a reason that Samu, you know, um, work practice is a very standard part of any retreat. If we were together, we would be doing that every day um, because it's a chance to just let, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the practice of letting doing do. Um, you know, easing toward it is this phrase, effortless effort. That's moving in that direction. Uh, so a very undivided. But then, as I said, there's this next shift where you actually disappear and it's just functioning. All these things are happening and no one's doing anything. It's enormous freedom and compassion. Um, that there is anything. <laughs> you know, it, if we really get close to this, it brings tears um, that we can be here doing this. What is it? What a marvel. You know, this is well, Wanshi when he talks about wonder. I mean, I'm sitting in front of a chair with a Zafu on it, supported by a book and a computer and arms and all of your faces. And there's nothing here. And yet, here we are. Um, so this practice, though, of letting doing do um, is just a wonderful opportunity, you know, off the cushion. And then on the cushion, um, letting breathing breathe. You know, even if thinking thinks, there's, there's just no problem. There is, it's, there's nothing going on. <laughs> incredibly free. I One other way to uh, taste this when sitting is to gradually in this spaciousness become aware that the whole room is sitting with you. Uh, Rian Roshi talks about this often. He says, when I sit, I have the feeling that the whole world is settling down. And, you know, he actually, this chair in front of me is sitting, the cupboard is sitting, the walls are sitting, the floor is sitting, you know, the, the afternoon light here is sitting. I mean, just the sounds are sitting. <laughs> it, it expands and, um, and, gets to just one sitting, whole world sitting, and then no one at all sitting. A questioner asks, can you talk about the utility of koans compared to other ways of recognizing our true nature? I'm thinking of contemplative traditions like Dzogchen and Douglas Harding's Headless Way, which contained pointing out instructions that seem more pragmatic than koans for catalyzing and awakening. I understand this topic may be outside the scope of our discussion today, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, uh, here at Mountain Cloud, Henry, uh, and I'm learning so much from it, he's really become um, over, over time quite interested in these, what he calls different zones of practice, mindfulness being the first. 
Um, and so uh, with him, I've attended a introductory mindfulness retreat. People who've done Vipassana will also you know, have more affinity for this maybe in their experience. Uh, but this is an active kind of practice. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are new, uh, it seems like all the time now coming on, coming out, um, the science of enlightenment and these practices that say, you know, look, here, here's, here's a direct path to this dropping off this non-dual experience, um, and these are steps you can take, you know, strategies, what, what you, the tools, what you actually do. Um, I'm fairly new to this. My experience um, so far, I can only speak from. So acknowledging its limits. Um, I, I think that mindfulness, at least, is um, very helpful at learning to observe what's going on, uh, to be in the present moment, um, to focus on one thing at a time, to get to know, you know, also your mind. <laughs> your body, your sensations, your emotions, uh, to, to see how all that works. And in seeing it, you know, more and more we see through it. Um, for me, the koan path is the most direct way I know to waking up, to really, uh, and this is endless, by the way. The horizon's always moving. It's very recognizable when, when you catch a glimpse of this world. You know it. And you can go to a teacher and it's very recognizable. And yet it, it's always, there's always more. It can always deepen, always get clearer. Not the world, the world is clear. But my uh, you know, experience of it can always get clearer. Um, so part of this response is coming up out of my own experience. Um, the two traditions I know the best are Soto and Rinzai. And um, Soto is... Master Wanchi, actually, this silent illumination, this deep, just sitting, total absorption in sitting. Uh, you know, very, very deep practice. And then, you know, the Rinzai tradition, I mean, the Soto school does use koans, but more in the way that somebody might stay with a koan for 10 years or their whole life, one. Dogen wrote quite a bit about koans and he's uh, you know, sort of a father of Soto in Japan. The Rinzai school took up koans, like Mumon calls them brickbats, to uh, break down the door, the gateless gate. <laughs> And uh, they can be so powerful, these little explosive devices that finally bring down the walls. Uh, it's what it's likened, our, our world. We live as if in a darkened room, Yamada Kon Roshi. And, you know, sitting with a koan is like, you know, the walls gradually get lighter and you may actually drill a hole through and you might be able to see, you know, this whole wide world on the other side, but in the beginning, you might just see this much of it. And then gradually the opening or the lens just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until there's no edge at all. Uh, 
Yeah. So I'm, what I, what I've particularly appreciate about Sambo Zen is this combination of Soto and Rinzai in this tradition. And as I said, though, now, um, there's increasingly an interest in understanding how these different practices, um, you know, work together or getting at uh, helpfully, maybe helpful to people. So you're not having to be limited to just one way. Um, so I, yeah, I um, don't feel thoroughly uh, equipped in terms of my own experience to speak to the practices that you named. But I, I have the inkling that I, I still have a little, this is very honest, <laughs> a little suspicion about, oh, come to my workshop for a day or a weekend and I'll teach you how to become enlightened. Uh, I feel like this opening, this shift, this what Dogen described as body and mind fallen away. Uh, that's not something we can construct. Uh, we can really prepare the way, but it comes like a thief in the night when it comes, stealing away everything. Is that it, Dan? A couple more questions. Okay. Uh, questioner asks, how do we know if we should move on to another practice? I've been watching my breath, but how would I know if I should move to an open awareness practice or something else? Yeah, um, I mean, this is where it would be so helpful to have a teacher. Uh, you know, you're, if you feel like, for example, with counting, um, I started out really, really uh, counting my breath. And at some, and still, uh, if, if, um, if a sit is distracted, I might go to that. Um, but what happened over time was it felt too busy. And so it just naturally, I stopped and just began to rest in the breath. Um, so I think there might be a similar move if, if resting in the breath, really attending to the breath, that kind of focused absorption, uh, is starting to feel limited, then give it a try. It's, you know, what if that opens out into spacious awareness? And then if you're sitting in spacious awareness and have a sit or a part of a sit where it's distracted, maybe go back, just, just pick up the, the focus on breathing until things quiet down. And then it, and you can let it kind of expand into spacious awareness. I think it's pretty fluid. Um, as long as we're not within a sit, trying to decide what to do, that's not helpful. It has to really be guided by, by your experience. Uh, and the same would go then if, you know, if it can happen for someone who's been just sitting and really tilled the soil of their practice and um, then they start to thirst for something more and that's when you would drop in a koan. One more? Okay, uh, yeah, there's, well, there's two more, um, both short, but maybe you can make a quick comment on both. Uh, do you have strategies for combating sleepiness while sitting, sleepiness? Yeah. Um, well, Henry always says, you know, if you're really sleepy, uh, take a nap, <laughs> uh, allow it, you know, go with it. I, I've never done that. I mean, um, my 
strategy when I'm sleepy uh, is to become more alert. Uh, you know, there's this balance. We talk about fully relaxed, fully alert. And, uh, you know, I'll actually go into the breathing. If I'm sitting with moo, we just, you know, I dig in a little because it's off balance. Um, or uh, you can also just watch it, give it some space, you know, um, and sometimes that will bring some energy. Um, but, you know, that's, that's if you want to work with it, if you really want to keep sitting and, and work with it. Uh, you know, up your concentration, notice your breathing. You can look in your body, what, what, what feels, you know, sort of scan around, well, where is this? What's causing this heaviness? Um, not analytically, but just to, you know, kind of notice, scan, like we notice uh, sometimes there's a constriction and then you just allow it some space, let that dissolve, you know, notice what's what's the, what the sense of sleepiness is and um, allow it some space and see if it dissolves. One thing for sure, it will change. Okay, um, we only have a minute or so left, but um, maybe you can just uh, address this. I'm not sure what the spelling is on this, but um, it asks, the, the, the questioner asks, why is Kenzo kinder? Is it kinder? Is it more helpful or is it just true? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, why is Kenzo kinder? Maybe it was Kensho. Um, if, Yes, can show. Thank you. Um, it's just true. It's just true. It's who you really are, which is from the tradition, one way of naming that is boundless compassion. And the more clearly we see who we truly are, yeah, these attributes just, they're there. They're there from the start, and we just get out of the way. So this boundless compassion, kindness is a quality of it. And the longing to help, uh, all of that springs from just who you really are. Yeah. This capacity the tradition is, is full of words for it, uh, pure, joyful, true self, eternal, uh, hearer of the cries of the world, yeah. at the ready to respond, really hear, hearing the cries of the world as your very own cries. And that naturally yields kindness, but it's, it's who we are. So thank you. Thank you all for these questions, for listening.